Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Rosari Mannion, PCC 2022 ICF Professional Coaches Global Board Director. Welcome to day two of the ICF Global Leaders Forum 2022. It is wonderful to be able to connect with all of you and my great pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you again for an excellent day one of GLF 2022. During day one, we focused on the topic of engagement as we explored the cultural focus of your chapter, learned strategies to engage with younger generations and contemplated new partnerships for our chapters to engage members of the younger generations. Today, we are focusing on the topic of education and growth. We will hear a keynote presentation from Peggy Hoffman on leading your chapter to succeed in 2022 and a recorded one ICF panel discussion with ICF's own CEO, Magda Mook, and vice presidents of each of the six family organizations. In the pre-work videos, which can be found on the GLF website under pre-work tab, you watched a video on the One ICF ecosystem, how professional coaches are part of One ICF, where you heard an overview of the ICF ecosystem. Today's special recorded panel discussion will be a closer look at the ICF ecosystem where you can get all your questions about One ICF answered. We are looking forward to the continued learning and connection with you, our chapter leaders today. Please use the chat function to share your thoughts during the session. Please obviously be respectful of others and mindful of ICF code of conduct and our core values of professionalism, collaboration, humanity, and equity. Translation is provided during general sessions using Worldly. For breakout rooms and networking sessions, we recommend using Google Translate. The, IC, the GLF workbook can be found under the live event tab on the GLF webpage. The workshop is fillable. We recommend the workbook for taking notes and following along with the program. Now, let me introduce you to our keynote speaker, Peggy Hoffman. Peggy is president of Mariner Management, an association management company which is home to two associations and provides an array of support and training to associations and more importantly, member volunteers. Peggy draws on her own team's research on volunteerism, member communities and association innovation in her training and counsel to dozens of global, national and local membership associations for over 30 years. Peggy not only enjoys working with association volunteers, but is an active volunteer for her professional association, including serving as a chapter past president, so she'll draw from experience on both levels. Read her full bio on marinermanagement.com and feel free to connect with Peggy on Twitter and on LinkedIn at Peggy Hoffman. And of course, don't forget to ask her about triathlons, dance, and living with three sons. Peggy recorded a special presentation for you on leading your chapter to succeed in 2022. And we will play that presentation for you now. Thank you. Hi, and um, welcome to our discussion today around leading your chapter to succeed in 2022. Um, Simon um, Senek says that the infinite game requires flexible strategies. And he talks about this notion of having a new playbook that is really a flexible playbook. And I think that's what we need in our chapters. And there's no doubt that the field has completely changed. And the playbooks that worked back in 2019, even those that we kind of shifted for 2020 and 2021, aren't going to really meet our needs going forward. Now, what's cool is that our cause... Um, having grassroots connections to and for our members is still relevant. It's the products and the services that need to change. We're kind of like Kodak in the 70s. So that's when they reportedly first developed the digital camera. And then they put it on a shelf <laughs> because they were concerned about it eating into the film sales. Well, I mean, most of us know the story. Digital takes over and Kodak is left behind. Now, I think that's where the story changes. I don't think we're like Kodak. And I think that we can change our products and our services. But very importantly, I think it's because 
we're willing, right, to um, have our new flexible playbook. And the reason why I know we're willing, well, it's because we have developed new habits. We already uh, we already have an understanding um, that that we need new habits to 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 navigate this time and that we actually have the capacity to embrace those new habits. I mean, our new habits, we've done, well, obviously, personal habits around how we're taking protections for ourselves professionally and really as chapter leaders. I guess three of the habits that I really saw as I worked with chapters around the globe was, first and foremost, this um, this ability to embrace ramping up decision-making. We couldn't kick the can down the road. We actually had to make decisions in the moment. We got better at that as uh, 2020 turned into 2021. We're also courageous. And by that, I mean, we just tried some new things. And what I thought was really cool is many of us, we, um, we did beta right along and with our members as we learned new technologies and new ways of communicating and approaching. And of course, we innovated. We're going to talk about some of the innovations that I saw in chapters um, around the globe. But it's important for us to also understand that while we were developing new habits, so were our members. Um, Well, let's start with, for example, showing up. I don't know how many of you were like the chapters that I manage here at, at Mariner, but we saw a lot of faces that we hadn't seen prior to the pandemic. And that, of course, was thanks to virtual and our ability to embrace that. But they also showed up for small jobs. They didn't always think of themselves as volunteering, but we saw more members stepping up to the plate to collaborate on action lists, on activities, on putting together in the moment meetings. This volunteering in small jobs opens up some doors for us as we look forward. And I think most importantly, what our members did was they dug deeper into the value propositions. Largely, this was around industry intel and in-the-moment advocacy. But interestingly, we saw some increases in some activity that I think really gives us, I would say, hope moving into 2022. Okay, what I'm talking about is there's been a number of studies done in the association field around memberships and, and how we fare throughout this time. One of the studies, which is a really exciting one that came out of community brands, is called Association Trends from Disruption to Opportunity. They talked to thousands of of members of professional and trade organizations. They found that 51% said, my association is more important since the pandemic. They also found that 39% said, yep, I'm interacting more. I have increased the way, the shape, and the frequency of which I'm connecting with my association. Now, interestingly, what's driving that? Though there's two elements that we found were driving this increased involvement, increased loyalty. 68% said it was having access to in-the-moment industry information. I was able to, well, come on home to my people and be able to, in that moment, get folks that understood me and get the information I needed to act in my job. 92% said most of that was driven by access about being online. It was access to online networking, to education. And interestingly enough, it was it was access to some of the programs and services that we hadn't seen much activity on. People began looking at our LMSs, for example, our learning management systems. So all of this is really good news. And it lays a groundwork, frankly, for us to begin to figure out this new flexible playbook. Let me tell you a little bit about how some chapters began to write their new flexible playbook. I got some stories I'd like to share with you from chapters from around the globe, stories that I picked up over the last 18 months, just being out there talking to folks. And there's some exciting activities that are happening. Now, let's start with chapter A. So this was a chapter that was keeping an eye on the regulators when the word came down about the COVID restrictions for reopening work sites. A quick call to a couple of members identified the true pain point in meeting these new restrictions. That shifted them into being kind of an education and advocacy group to being a central clearinghouse for PPE in Texas. Now, 
this is all about responding to the immediacy of the members' needs. The members did not care that they didn't have a monthly meeting to go to that month. They cared that their association listened and acted. Now, advocating is part of any many of our DNAs and our chapters, but in this particular case, the board called a virtual meeting of any member who could show up. The mission, how do we get the public to shift from thinking about canceling all their special events to postponing them? And in also to being to see the impact of closures on their trusted service providers. So now this was a um, this was a special events. Um, special events uh, chapter, and they saw their members' incomes go shoop, but postpone, don't cancel, became a campaign that saved the profession in Maine. It also led them to opening up some doors for advocating with regulators on getting some of the restrictions shifted around uh, special events. This next story is actually about how a chapter saved their sponsorship program. You see, in this particular chapter, um, most of their monthly events are free of charge. So their big revenue source are their sponsors. And with all of their events going away, this president went, is this mean we're not going to have money just at the time when we need to rethink and retool our organization? So he called up sponsors. Now, listen to the way the conversation went. It wasn't, oh, please, 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 please keep sponsoring us. It was, wow, you're a sponsor. You've made a financial investment. We want to use this financial investment to really support members. Let's work together to figure out how to do that. That wonderful set of conversation meant they didn't lose sponsorships. What they did get were hosted virtual, hosted virtual roundtables up to the minute COVID resource page and Friday update email, all which replaced regular scheduling, but kept those sponsors excited and happy. So I think a large part that we've talked about all of these things really comes down to listening, right? Well, here's an example of where listening really kicked off a whole new volunteer surge. So this particular chapter held a series of virtual lunches around member requests. So the idea was, we're gonna have a virtual lunch, what do you wanna talk about? Well, the issues came back to DEI. This was a time when the pandemic was really um, in intersecting with the protests and the conversations around racial injustice. And for this particular community, that was a, that was a very poignant um, conversation. And so they begin to talk about how do we act personally? How do we act appropriately in our workplaces? That led to a work group. That work group became their first committee on really embedding the conversation around diversity, equity, and inclusion into their chapter's work plan. And that brought new faces, fresh faces, people that they hadn't seen at any event prior to that, led to a fresh board in 2021. And that reinvigoration has continued in 2022. Pretty exciting stuff when you take a look at how finding an opportunity to listen to members allows you to create programming that actually engages more members. Now, a common part of all of this is, is that I'm partnering with people, right? I'm not silent. I'm not doing, alone, doing it alone. And this next story is all about a chapter who took a real difficult situation by applying partnering concept was able to dig themselves out of a hole. Central class for licensing didn't have a virtual option. It did, however, for this chapter, had a industry partner who was particularly interested in the content in this class. So armed with an industry partner who would help in helping to resource they and with the in-person course materials, access to Zoom, they put together in a, in a, in a real quick pivot dance, they took a eight hour course and created it online. Now, what I want you to take a look at in this is there's a couple of other elements here. Yes, the reason why this chapter was able to do this was because they'd already invested, they already begun really exploring the power of Zoom and webinars as an extension to their education program. So they weren't in too new of a territory. But the biggest thing was the fact that they had this partner arrangement with this industry partner. And here's the other part, 
they brought in other chapters. And by partnering with other chapters, while this was a course that was known, but a whole new format in front of a screen, they were able to sell out that first class and have since sold out twice more. Now here's an extra little, I think it's kind of like the icing. The industry partner said to them that part of their strategic plan prior to coming into COVID was to move away from a transactional type relationship with the industry to truly walking hand in hand to move the industry forward. They saw this as a gleaming opportunity to do that. Our next story is also building on this idea of collaboration. So for this particular um, organization, it's a global um, association. And this global association has a lot of members who work for global companies. And the reason why this is important to know is that while I may be um, in Canada or the, or the US or South Africa, the reality is I'm working for an organization that has people in many different countries. And so, wow, that just means their members had to deal with a wide variety of COVID related restrictions and scenarios. So what do you do? Well, it started with their South African chapter reaching across the, uh, the waters to be able to collaborate on content. Pretty soon, South African chapter, Australian chapters, Canadian chapters, UK chapters, and US chapters hosted a set of global conversations. Collaborating across chapters allowed them to address some immediate needs for members. Celebrating. This is maybe one of my most favorite stories, and I'll tell you why. Many of these things are meeting the 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 the, the tangible in the moment needs that that um, that a member has. Right? We're giving them PPE. We're helping them. Um, we're helping them keep clients. We're giving them industry information in the moment that that they need it. We're helping them address an emerging topic. Right? We're out helping them get the education that they need. But this last one is about self care. And one of the things that we learned in this incredible um, scenario is the importance of taking care of each other and of yourself. So they have an awards program. It's been, it's been a pretty good, solid program, and it always looks backward, right? Well, they said, you know, we don't, our people are stressed. They, they, they you know, um, workforces are down. They don't have the money. We should shelve the program. And then someone said, but wait a minute. They've been working overtime in really answering the twin calls of the pandemic and the racial upheaval. Don't we, shouldn't we celebrate the fact that we were all able to pivot? That became a reimagined annual awards program that actually drew more than the average entries, more attendees, more winners, more sponsors. Why? Because it gave them a moment to come together for some much needed self-care and some sort of the picture here, I love that, is a picture of they went to a, a local um, local bar that had been, of course, closed, but was doing takeout because it was allowed for the regulations. They did a special cocktail for this particular program. That is the, um, the owner of the bar mixing the drink, and then they gave the ingredients and they sent it to the local folks. Connecting with the community, celebrating how we were doing. The last story I wanted to share with you right now is one really about expanding. So we all know that the lines, the geographic lines that hold our chapters really blurred over this time as accessible education allowed people to reach over uh, and around to be able to get access to the information and the people that they wanted. So you saw some, you know, some skirmishes, if you will, let's say a little, competition for the screen time. Yeah, not so with this particular chapter. They said, how do we create, how do we create something different? How do we build on, how do we expand the offerings? And this is what they did. Because so much of what their organization nationally was doing were webinars that were deeper dives, right? They were four hour webinars or they were three or six hour webinars, deep dives, which were really intended as training on different topics. So they began to build their educational schedule where if they knew this particular program was coming up, they might do one the week before, or two weeks before that was a 101, warmed you up for this deeper conversation. Or this conversation took here, they did one over here and it was on the, it was on the, the, the summary of this particular program. 
In one case, they took a new regulation that was being trained and discussed here, and they did a follow-up session, which was on, now you know the new regulation, here's how it plays out in our town. That's called expanding. And they were able to get the headquarters to kind of to help them coordinate, and they were able to share some speakers. Win, 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 win. Now, all of these are examples of chapters who did something differently. They pivoted. They began rewriting a new playbook in this time. What's the common, common theme or the common thread here? Well, I think it's that, well, they moved from business as usual to find a meaningful space for them. It meant they were courageous enough to try new things. It meant, well, shifting from the mindset of we have to do all this stuff that's on our checklist to no, we have to meet the immediate needs of our community and actually less is more. For each of these chapters, they didn't expand their program of services, they contracted it and they focused it. But in every one of these cases, it also meant engaging members outside the circle. It was about bringing people in to help out. It was about tapping new volunteer models in part. It was about not thinking about volunteering or filling the seats on the board, but rather how do we get the work done? And most importantly, it was about collaborating was collaborating with the members. Um, when we take a look at the, we take a look at the, um, at the conversation around uh, the, the DEI work, that was bringing members to the table to create solutions. The um, industrial hygienist, one of their, um, one of their chapters, um, took the regulations on effective workplace reopening, applied the regulations that they were living in right in that chapter and created in the moment materials. But they were able to do that by collaborating with members. The PPE story was really about collaborating with the community, reaching out saying, this is necessary, we wanna save jobs. Maine, the, the special events folks, it was about creating a campaign that had the synergy that was happening with the tourist, um, the tourist community that allowed them to have a seat at the table as the regulators were figuring out how do we come out of COVID. And it was about you know, collaborating with, with customers and industry partners. But did you hear how many times it was also about collaborating with other chapters? You see, we don't have to create everything here in our own silo. If I have a strength and you have a strength and those two strengths will come together to build something bigger, we magnify the energy and the innovation, right? Collaborating can take a concept around understanding how to work in a workplace and just illuminate it by bringing in voices from another part of the world. Collaborating it allows us to build something that's going to meet the members' needs, even though we have a, we're oftentimes strained for resources. So I know that we're busy, and sometimes you go, I don't have enough time to get the stuff done here for my own chapter, much less figure out what's going on. And I'm telling you, the flexible playbook says collaborate first, and then go back and say, what, other, what else can I do? I think all of this, these are all messages that tell us that, the, uh, that we can create flexible playbooks that'll meet our needs in 22 and beyond. In fact, let's switch gears for just a moment. Let's fuel this shift. Let's fuel this movement of finding this new fle flexible uh, playbook by looking at some of the trends that support this direction that we're going in. I want to share with you four trends in the association space. Now, as a background, I come, I have always been, my entire job has been working in and with and around associations. We have a small management company. Our goal here is to work with locally based organizations, most of whom have a national or global organization connected with them, to help them create the member value in the grassroots. But we've also done a lot of the industry research on volunteerism, member engagement, and chapters. 
So I take that hands-on experience and I, and, and I have a research background. And then I also serve on the ASAE, one of their research committees around foresight drivers, where this is where we're always looking to the future. We're looking for the weak signals way out there. So these four trends are, there. there's many trends to look at, but these four trends come from that background of research and foresight and hands-on. And I bring these to you because I think these are the ones that are really poignant for those of us in chapters. So let's start. The first trend I wanna share with you is this idea of member value and being connected to the linkages, to the, to the, to the people, to the resources that we meet. We tend to think of the value as how much money we've saved somebody. We tend to think of the value in terms of, well, it's, it's, it's how many, how many um, CEs you get for the dollars. And what members tell us is the value is how many connections I got through you. All the research in this time has told us that member participation and loyalty is driven by meeting my must-haves today and by helping me make connections to travel my journey with. Now, member engagement um, is growing and loyalty is growing in those associations which focus on making those connections. Those associations which really narrow down on industry information, now training new skills, credentials and certifications that build my profile for future advancement and bringing people together in small, medium, and large ways. They have come through COVID beautifully. Mm-hmm. Members um, focus on must-haves. They focus on what do I need today to get the job done? They focus on what kind of, you know, what kind of information needs to be in the public or to my key stakeholders to make sure I can have the right conversations. They focus on having the training and the skills. And so if we link members, in, as we talk about in this particular trend, if we link members to those resources and those people, they'll be loyal. The next one's going to come no surprise. I'm sure you expected there to be a trend about um, digital. Digital is uh, now integral to, um, well, frankly, it's an integral part of every event. I'm not saying that you have to have every event's a virtual or every event's hybrid. I'm just saying that it is an important part of every event. Virtual, you see, opened up doors. It created accessibility. Now, for those of us who are really looking at how do we answer the question positively, um, are we an inclusive chapter? Are we an inclusive group, an inclusive community? Virtual helped us say yes more often. But here's the important thing. All this virtual activity has reset expectations. Now, what we saw coming in to uh, COVID was how social media and um, digital interactions had already begun to reset expectations. But we still had a pretty robust connection to in-person events and to paper, right? But things really shifted forward and it reset expectations and in particular reset expectations for chapters. You see, part of what happened was it used to be that I had to get in the car to participate with you. Now, some of us were already doing some. The reality is, is now that I'm able to find out that I don't have to get in the car all the time, it doesn't mean I don't want to get in the car potentially some of the time. But it does mean I'm now looking and expecting this to happen to you. So how does this, how do we translate this to us? Well, I'm going to suggest to you, it's not about us trying to be hybrid. Hybrid takes money, effort, and energy. If you can do it, I'm going to say, do it. If you're collaborating across some chapters or collaborating with, with uh, international, you, you potentially do it. No, what I'm saying is that for many of the chapters, the folks that I, the, the, the groups that I manage here, we don't have large budgets or large memberships. I'm talking about, in embedding virtual in the overall set of events. I'm talking about moving away from that big event or events as silos and saying, how do we build um, virtual meeting rooms, ebb and flow of activity that follow, connect with our own particular events or activities? So for example, 
I'm going to have this, let's say, in-person meeting. I have a, and um, one of the things we do is the real estate update and we bring in some feds and we bring in some, um, some real estate gurus and stuff like that. We bring them in. It's, a, it's an in-person event. Leading into that, we could have some pre-meeting discussion groups about what we're seeing and trends. A leading coming out of that, we could have a learning circle or a or a, or a virtual roundtable talking about what we heard and how we're going to act on it. And in and around it, we can have some asynchronous information con, information uh, uh, content. We could have um, we could have some chats over here. We could have we could have a, a discussion board over here. We could have some content that is developed right here that came out of that that is that is leading questions that you can take back to your office and use. I'm talking about finding those opportunities. If you've got a speaker, can you get a good setup from your video company and, um, and, and live stream that one speaker? Can you take that particular video and show it later? Can you do like we're doing here, pre-record and then have small group conversations? I'm talking about allowing ourselves to have an opportunity to connect with people who will not get in that car and drive. And let me tell you, I think the real win here is that it's going to create opportunities for greater global connection. And, and just, uh, just a little a personal story here. So I am the mom of three boys. Uh, my, they, they span the age. They're, they, they span the age from 38 down to 24. So the 24 is some people may draw the lines would say a Z or a very young Y. So he has been to more countries. In and he's 24, I've been to more countries in his 24 years, most of those on his own dime than I was by the time I was 45. Now I've done a lot of travel in my adult age and, I, and, and it's opened my eyes and created new opportunities. This is embedded in him. And my other two have been have traveled as well. So why am I saying this? Well, we want to really engage all of our generations that are in the workplace and, and in the communities now us being able to have those global connections is priceless, is priceless. Okay, this next uh, trend um, kind of brings or builds on or actually it connects the first two trends. And this is all around content. So this is a massively changing world um, that we're in right now. And it's about emerging channels. It's about all the proliferation of channels. It's about how I can integrate with the content that I connect with. It's how can I share it? How can I collaborate on? How can I be part of building it? The message here for chapters, it's about understanding that content is a driver for engagement. It's about understanding that, that the first place that gets us to pay attention to you when you send something to us is the fact that there's a piece of content there that is intriguing or appears interesting. Now, at the chapter level, it's important it, that we do understand that content is king. I think it's more critical in this day and age that we understand that if content is king, context is queen. And in a good game of chess, um, the king tends to stay alive when the queen is in play. So for chapters, it boils down, I believe, to not trying to have our content in all the different channels and maybe not even being, you know, being limited in how people can interact with it, but that we're delivering content in the right moment. We're honoring the queen. We're thinking of the context. So this is about the dental hygienist who, um, who um, did the beautiful content around getting a good fit on your K95 mask. It's about uh, the um, industrial hygienist doing the safety protocols for reopening the office in the context of that particular community. It's about the Project Management Institute's um, chapter that came up with some in the moment short pieces about how to do uh, management processes to support a virtual team. Now, yes, they're technology heavy anyway, but there were nuances, there were changes, and there was also just this sense of you're doing it right, let me remind you. It's about our opportunity, I think, actually, to leverage the unique role as curators. 
Now, let's talk about what I think might be the most important of these four trends, and that is how volunteering has changed. Now, in the association space, we've actually been watching this since about 2008. We've been doing a lot of research in which we've been looking at how the drivers have been evolving. There's been some great research out of Australia, out of Canada, looking at this from the, um, the, the service, the social service agencies. But the associations began to notice that they had to ask the question specifically about people who were professionals and they were volunteering for their association because we began to notice that the drivers were slightly different. You see, for the drivers, for volunteers, and I think this is going to feel pretty familiar to many of you, it needs to have a two-part, right? It has to have this opportunity for something for me to connect to me as a professional and to give to others. Or as I like to say, it has to have the internal and the external element. As the research coined, it has to be pro-social. It has to have both of those elements. And and here's the second important part the research has told us. This was evident in 08. We repeated the question in 2016, resoundingly the same way. It has to be accessible, aka shorter in duration, clearer in outcome, fully resourced. Did you know that 60% of folks that raise their hand to volunteer for an association, a chapter or national or global organization, prefer something that is under a year, yeah. prefer something that is, um, well, frankly, something that I can get in, do, see a difference is made and get back out again. I think that we have, by holding on to our traditional structures, it creates friction and volunteers don't want that. Um, and that we also spend far too little time on the conversation of clarity, measurable outcomes and resources. You know, volunteering is up for those organizations that have found a way to engage people in smaller, in the moment, measurable outcome, impactful opportunities. So let's take these four trends. How can we act on these four trends? I've got five ideas here for you. Now, it's not my intention that you pick all five. I want you to find one, hopefully, that you guys, that maybe you could, in terms of getting your board together, having an intentional conversation around these. Maybe you do all five. Maybe you start with the first one, which gives you a roadmap or a path forward, and then you play with some of the others. The first one is to debrief the 2021. And I'm, I want you to get kind of beyond the what into the why. I want you to allow this to be an intentional conversation that helps you learn so that you can make the changes in your chapter structures, decision-making and resource planning that allows you to be the best that you can be in 22. So yes, it's, a, it's, an, it's an after action review. Many of you might do this in your own jobs, in your own roles, in your own lives. And I want you to apply this concept to the chapter. So what I want you to do is to ask questions like, what were we trying to accomplish? Um, and then did we, how close were we? How did it work? All of this is coming to, was the goal clear? Did we, did we have a clear goal about what, what we wanted the outcome to be? If it went well, why did it go well? If it didn't quite meet the needs, how far off from meeting the needs were it? I want you to look at that expectation. Sometimes we, we, we bing ourselves for what didn't work without understanding how close we were, which then begins to help us go, this little switch would have made a difference. I think it's also important that we ask ourselves, what, um, what approaches or processes did we have that we were able to lean on moving in? In other words, it gave us kind of the heads up. An example of this would be that chapter I talked about who had already really started embracing um, Zoom and other technology to begin to offer some virtual opportunities. Ah, they had a technology commitment. They had resourced it. They'd begun to play with it. That supported them, tells you that that was a good choice. 
It was allowing you to begin to be digital, allowing you to begin to ask the education. So what do we have to do, you might ask then, to continue our digital formation? Maybe you didn't have that. Maybe you find out, well, when you ask the question, were there any constraints or barriers? Yeah, well, we hadn't done any of that. Well, we probably want to begin to look at how do we embrace technology. Now, when you do this debrief, I'm gonna ask you to not just keep it to the little leader circle. I'm gonna ask you to reach out to anybody who did anything with you and ask them, how did it go? Ask them some of those questions of the hows and the whys, not just the whats. All right, let's move through these other elements here because I think that any of these other ones are real small in some, in some ways, and you can maybe pick one of these and just try the low hanging fruit. The next one is get members involved. Now, I'm not talking about calling them up and saying, hey, you wanna volunteer? I'm talking about reaching out, engaging and collaborating with them. I'm talking about, you're gonna to put together, let's say your, your, your event schedule and you're gonna poll, but I'm not talking about a survey, what do you want? Like yeah, have A, B or C, which makes sense. What do you know about? What do you know about this? What do you know about that? Collects information from them. Um, I'm talking about picking up the phone and talking to members, asking them um, what's on their desk today, how do they feel, uh, what's, what's the burning question that they have, what have they recently discovered that's really cool. That's how you begin to get their stories that you can build into your own event planning. I'm talking about focus groups. One of the things that we did for our, um, our virtual meeting is rather than having a planning committee, we pulled together a group of members, but hey, we're going to put together in a virtual event. We want to make sure that it's a content that you want. Come for this meeting. It's going to be 45 minutes. Yeah, we keep things under an hour in our place. 45 minutes. We had a couple of questions. They did that. You know, Several of those folks then helped us actually build the program. Work groups, virtual teams, I want you to get members involved. Find ways to get members involved. Have, make your event schedule be as many events where you're bringing members together to collaborate on how the organization is getting its work done as you do education or training. Reach out to your sister chapters. Reach out and ask. Hey, what's on your work plan? This is on our work plan. How can we work together on that? Um, say, hey, I got this strength and I need to find um, a, a solution for this less than strength, right? Oh, I got another chapter. Oh, I, I have that strength. What happened with that one, the, the, the one story I told you is the first chapter that collaborated with the chapter that was building this program said, I don't have capacity to take a program like that and create an online version. And you do. I'm with you because he had the support. I want you to look at sponsors as partners, just like that one, that one example did, call them up. We're in this together. And lastly, I want you to think about picking three. All the research that we've talked about says that effective chapters don't offer a long list. They offer a list that meets the immediate needs. All right, we've talked about trends, we've given you some stories, we've given you some action items. Let's go in your rooms and talk. Thank you for letting me be with you today. Wow, what a wide ranging presentation we had there and so relevant and interesting to us in ICF and of course to you, our volunteer leaders. We heard about grassroots connections, the need to innovate, how new develop, the development of new habits impacts our members, Good news for us, 51% believe associations are more important since the pandemic. Of course, the importance of associations listening, acting, engaging with members, moving from transactional relationships to collaborative relationships, and of course, the need for the flexible playbook, the four trends, and five great ideas. So plenty of food for thought there. So we're now going to transition into our small breakout sessions on volunteer engagement and for the discussions to discuss the following questions, which we're going to see on screen. And again, these questions can be found in your GLF workbook and will also be shared in the chat to make things easy for us. So when you go into your smaller groups, be sure to identify your group leader who will be responsible for reporting out the key learnings when we return to the main room in about 15 minutes. So enjoy and see you back soon. Thank you.
Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. And let's hear from a few of our breakout group leaders on key learnings from the group discussions. Firstly, I'd like to introduce my good colleague, Malcolm Files. And Malcolm is Regional Development Manager for Africa, and he's going to assist me with the report outs. So please raise your hand to be called on, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. And also, if I could ask the group leaders to please add any of your learnings or comments in the chat as we're going along. Thank you. Have we any hands there, Malcolm? Thanks, Rosari. Um, yeah, so let's just see who's got the gallery view. There we go. So any group that would like to just give us some feedback and remember just unmute yourself when you do, uh, you are called upon to speak. I think our first person that we've got, Boris from Slovakia. Boris. Yeah, Hi, thank you so much. Yes, uh, I hope you can hear me. So <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, in other group, we were representatives, uh, two from US, one from Kenya, from Iceland, from Slovakia, myself. Uh, what we managed was to discuss two questions. Uh, the, the last one was uh, the cooperation um, with sister chapters. So uh, what came out was that uh, uh, it makes sense if we cooperate with our neighboring chapters. So it's a kind of geographical based cooperation that has a long tradition, for example, in the Nordics, as, as a colleague from Iceland said, and um, from Kenya was reported as well that in the region, uh, as the chapters used to cooperate. So th th there are some fundamentals for that. Um, the other question that we went through uh, was the ad hoc engagement. Uh, so, uh, in that case, we said um, it works, let's say, pretty well uh, project-based uh, when, when some new people can be involved and they love to cooperate. Uh, for example, I shared uh, some examples uh, like, like uh, peer retreats where coaches meet, uh, where they help to organize the agenda, they bring um, exercises, they bring um, introducing of the experience. So in that case, they are very active. Um, on the other hand, uh, once again, I brought the example um, in, in Slovakia, on our boards are some members for a longer time uh, that is very good for the continuum because the knowledge does not get lost. Uh, it's just accumulated, that's fine. Maybe it is not so easy for new members to enter. So they are pretty shy. So uh, uh, in that very direction, we have to be very active and to invite the people and to, to, to explain to them uh, what does it mean, you know, to cooperate on the board. And finally, what is uh, unifying us, it is a kind of friendship and interest. It's not a duty. It's, it's a love for being together and for act together. So it, it's not work, it's just a fun. But thank that you, is Boris. That's, point. That, that is so enlightening and really just let's speak to the very best of our volunteers that we want to do that. And thank you for sharing that with us. Really excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Malcolm. Boris. Um, and um, I think we've got Landre. Um, Landre, just before you go, Amy posted to say that they had some great chats in the in the in the group. Um, so Amy it would be nice if you put in the chat for us what it is those great ideas is that you guys shared, so that we can all kind of hear and learn from them as well. We're really looking forward to that. Um, Landre, over to you. Right, sir. Thanks, thanks, Malcolm. Hello, all. Uh, group. Hi, Landre. I, we had um, Stephen Jones from Philadelphia, Carrie Chown from Sacramento, and Malcolm here. And uh, my name is Larry from ICF Nigeria. So we, answered, we looked at the first question and um, member surveys uh, was one of the things that came through that are being done where members are asked um, to contribute to the planning of what the chapter will do. Coaching cafes or coffees, as uh, some other people refer to them, is when you have members gather together over coffee and have conversations about different things. And the, the chapter board then takes ideas from those coaching cafes 
to create their plans. And the other one we had was uh, open spaces where rather than uh, tell the members what you intend to do to put questions on the table and have uh, different breakout groups come together and discuss and the answers to those questions generate the plans that are then used in the chapter. This was shared by Malcolm, South Africa Coaching Cafe is by Kari and the members of it by Stephen. And from uh, ICF Nigeria, one which we have done and we're repeating again this year is to take the member list and divide it up to the board members. So everybody gets a list of six to nine members of the chapter. And we agree generally three questions to ask them and the board members get to call the chapter members. So there are phone calls. We give ourselves about two weeks or a month to make the calls and you call to the members, connect with them and just ask questions like what did, what have we done that you like? What do you think I have as an idea that we can do and just generally connect with them. And those calls have been very useful and then we collate. So board members are required to take notes during the call. We collate the output of the calls and use that as part of the planning for the year. So we find common things that people like and tie to, the, to them again. Any interesting new ideas from the calls and then we will leverage that. So those are the ideas that came from, uh, from the room. Thanks, Very Alana. innovative. Yeah, well done. Thank you. Mm, we've got time for one more, and I think it's uh, Czech Republic. And now, um, please correct me if I'm wrong. Is it Marketa? Marketa? Thank you. It's uh, Marketa. We were just a small group, just three ladies, me. Uh, Dina from uh, Netherlands and uh, one really, and I now really read because I forget the name, but one a really nice lady from Chile, and we were discussing about importance of uh, helping our members to understand the value of membership that they are not uh, not always aware of how they can connect, uh, which activities uh, we bringing to them. And it's important to visualize the value of membership in our chapters in a global, uh, in a, also in global visual, like visualize that uh, for them. And also we were speaking about importance of collaboration between uh, cha chapters. And Dina shared that they have a tight relationship with Belgium because they have very similar languages, but different cultures. So for example, they organize webinars about cultures and I hope that we will be able to cooperate with Slovakia as I see some people from Slovakia here. So I would love to connect and maybe also create some webinars or some activities together. So. That's all from my side. Ex excellent, lovely feedback. Thanks for sharing. And so good to see the collaboration starting. That's what it's all about. So do reach out, make those connections, keep in contact. That's what we all want among our volunteer community. 